Hello. Hi, welcome, 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 welcome to California College of the Arts. It's fantastic to see such an energetic crowd. Um, to, this is uh, an incredible event, part of our Design Division Lecture Series. I'm Helen Maria Nugent. I am lucky enough to be the Dean of Design here. Yay, Deans, Dean, Dean, it's great. I want to just quickly give you a little bit of an overview of what we do here at CCA and an invitation to join us for the rest of the events that are part of this uh, semester series. And I'd like to thank Chris Hamamoto, who is Assistant Professor of Graphic Design. He designed all of the, the beautiful poster that you see, all of our graphics here. He designed our Instagram posts. And so every semester, I invite one of our talented faculty to, to do all the design for us. So the design division at CCA, we are about a thousand students strong, believe it or not. It's a lot of designers studying here. And we have nine programs, six undergraduate programs and three graduate programs. And we are a sanctuary for creative risk taking. This is how we like to think of ourselves. We're the kind of place where you can come and have ideas and your faculty will ex help you explore those ideas. It's a really important thing that we do. And we like to think that what we do as designers matters in the world, so we make design that matters. So tonight, I'm super excited. We have Dory Turnstile here. Um, I'm not going to do the introduction because someone else is, but before, I wanted to put a smiling picture on there. Um, it's such a pleasure. I got to talk with Dory a bit this morning. I have so much to learn from her as a dean. She's done such incredible work at OCAD, and it was a pleasure, and I look forward to more engagement with you. Um, and I want to uh, thank the faculty who are working on the Decolonial School Initiative, who are really responsible for making tonight's event. And the, the yes, thank you. <laughs> and then tomorrow's um, Decolonial Unconference, uh, which is going to be fantastic. And so the people just off the top here are Kathy Lam of the Furniture Programme, Juan Carlos Rodriguez Rivera and Rachel Berker in graphic design, uh, Shalini Agrawal and Sheila Pancheo Hamilton of Diversity Studies. And always our program manager, Christy McGee, who just helps make all this magic happen here for us. So I'd like to introduce and welcome Shaila, who is going to come and introduce Dory. So thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Hello. I'm going to read a bit, so bear with me while I do this. Um, Horshe Yukane, alafia, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the first part of the uh, Decolonial Unconference at California College of the Arts. I am Shyla Pacheco Hamilton. I am one of the co-founders of the Decolonial School. I am also Chair of Diversity Studies and Assistant Professor um, in the First Year Core Program here at CCA. It is with great pleasure that I introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Dori Tunstall, who will is here tonight to further and deepen the conversation around decolonizing practices in academia. CCA has embarked on its decolonial project most recently with the implementation of the Decolonial School, and Dr. Tunstall has been one of our guiding lights. As Tunk and Yang have taught us, decolonization is not a metaphor, but is an ongoing engaged practice that requires constant negotiation between what is thought to be known, what is being taught, what is being produced, and what is being experienced. As we gather together as professors, students, administrators, thinkers, makers, writers, designers, we must come to understand the different forms by which colonization operates, external, internal, and settler, while also understanding not all forms of colonization are the same. There are a variety of ways to engage in social justice and education. These arise from the varieties of injustices in education, racism, sexism, heterosexism, classism, ableism, capitalism, imperialism, militarism, colonization, etc. Justice movements take on one or more of these centers, but lumping them together is problematic. It leads to a loss of meaning. It leads to a loss of meaningful engagement especially with respect to colonization. 
it can only serve to reify the settler colonial position rather than challenge it. Our speaker has spent her career helping folks understand where we are situated in relationship to decolonization, its impact on our professional practices and on our pedagogies. As a design anthropologist, Dr. Tun Stahl is a designer of possibility. It is her belief that opening up the space for people to contribute possibilities is part of decolonization as a community practice. It is in this spirit that I invite all of you to approach this evening and the workshops tomorrow from the space of decolonial love. A colleague of mine, who cannot be here tonight, Yomira Figueroa has written, decolonial love demands a faithful witnessing of humanity and affinity across difference. This involves learning to see faithfully from multiple points of view, which in turn requires a decolonial attitude and imagining radical repair and reparation to the modern colonial world. Good people, please join me in welcoming the first black and black female dean of a faculty of design from Ontario College of Art and Design University, Dr. Dory Tunstall. We acknowledge the traditional territories of the Ahaloni peoples of the Bay Area, including the Chochenyo and Karken of East Bay, the Rametush of San Francisco, the Yokuts of South Bay and Central Valley, and the Muwakma tribe throughout the region, who are the original custodians of the land upon which we are gathered. Good evening and thank you. Um, I'm Dory Tunstall, Dean of Faculty Design at OCAD University. And I'm gonna talk to you about decolonizing practices in academia, drawing from the work that we're doing at OCAD University in Toronto, Canada. So OCAD University is one of the oldest and largest art and design institutions um, in Canada. It is actually the third um, largest art and design institution in North America. And I tell you this just to give you sen a sense of kind of the context of the scope of the work we're doing. So at OCAD, there's about uh, 3,400 students, of which 2,600 are I'm accountable to about 2,600 design students um, of my own as the dean of the faculty of design. So um, as indicated, I'm the first black and black female dean of a faculty design anywhere in the world. Um, and I'm a design anthropologist and I'm African American. And so the combination of those things means that I approach design in a very different way. And I'm very lucky to go to, um, to be able to um, engage in sort of authentic leadership at OCAD University because we approach design in very different ways um, there as well. So the work that we do, the ethos of design at OCAD is, is around this notion of respectful design. Um, and I'll go through and show you a, a little bit more of what we mean, but I think at this part of the story, what's important to remember um, is that as a d design anthropologist, I'm very interested in the relationship between the values that ex are expressed by an institution, how those things get translated tangibly into a sort of formalized design, and then what are the experiences that one um, has of those values as translated through design. I start this by saying that design has been pretty disrespectful um, to BIPOC peoples. Um, communities and the land, and by BIPOC, it's a term that we use um, in Canada to describe uh, black, indigenous, and people of color, um, which when I first came to uh, Canada, I was really confused because I always assumed that the term people of color included black folks, 
And actually, if you understand the history of that term, it was started by black folks. Um, but as I learn more about the separations it has to do, which I'll go through, is that there's different positionalities that we have in relationship to the land. And there's different positionalities that we have in relationship to structures of um, assimilation and oppression. And so I'm going to walk through those to kind of explain uh, what I mean by BIPOC and what do I mean in the, the ways in which design has been disrespectful to those groups in different ways. One of the things that is the saddest part of my job is when I have conversation with students and they talk about the way in which they must choose between their beautiful, intersectional, diverse identities and being a professional designer. And the reason why is that in many ways the values of design have been and still are colonial, white supremacist, patriarchal, and capitalist. I'm, I'm basically eating it. Um, so the values of design have been and still are colonial, white supremacist, patriarchal, and capitalist, which means if you do not align yourself with those values, guess what? You end up feeling like design is not a place where you belong. And the context around this, so Canada, much like the United States, is what Yang and Tuck, which all of you seem to be quite familiar with, call a settler colonial state, which means that within the context of the state, there are three positionalities that one can take. That of indigenous, who are the original owners and custodians of the land. Settlers, who came uh, later to build their good life on the land. And then uh, due to um, needing to create a new labor force due to sort of genocidal um, policies as well as disease, uh, groups of individuals were brought in as slaves um, to provide labor. And so those are kind of the three positionalities in the colonial state. What's important to understand is the relationship to the land. So the land itself has been stolen and pillaged. Um, and then how the government works in terms of assimilationist policy where generally there's policies are set up um, to be genocidal both culturally as well as uh, in language as well as in the peoples in and of itself against those who are non-Europeans. So this uh, affects the relationship between BIPOC people and design. So one of the big issues, again, in terms of indigenous communities is issues of um, appropriation and misappropriation. This is an example of, so the British fashion label KTZ stole the sacred design of a Canadian Inuit shaman named Aua. The reason why they felt it was okay to steal this sacred design, again, has to do with the relationship between the colonial state and indigenous peoples. So again, the indigenous peoples are the original owners and custodians of the land itself. And in the context of Canada, they spent over 500 years fighting against the similarist policies, um, both in terms of the Indian Act, which actually defined who was Indian and not Indian, and then also in terms of uh, the residential schools, which sought to separate indigenous peoples from their languages and their communities as a way in which, in which physical genocide was not successful. They undertook a process of cultural genocide. So the reason why it is considered by those in the settler position that it's OK to steal indigenous sacred design is that, in some cases, they don't think indigenous people still exist, right? So let's say, in the context of asking permission, who do you ask permission from? Now, in this case, the granddaughter of Shaman Awu was alive and actually quite reported the fact that these designs were stolen. But again, this is a way in which design itself is not separate from the practices of government, the practice of colonization. And in fact, for my indigenous students, of which we have a, a great number of, for our indigenous students, their encounter often with design is constantly reminding them of their non-existence because many designers are taking their sacred symbols and their sacred um, cosmologies and turning it into commercial fashions that are available for everyone. And when, you, when, we when I talk to my indigenous colleagues and we bring indigenous 
um, practitioners of design and art into the, into the school, the reason why they say this is so harmful is that in a context in which you've lost, in many ways, your language, in which you've lost your family structure, in which you've lost your beliefs, that sometimes these symbols and motifs are the only thing that you still have holding on as an aspect of who you are and your culture. And so to have those things stolen, again, is to revisit all of the trauma and pain and the sense of non-respect, right, um, that has been visited on indigenous communities for 500 years. So it is in this context that my indigenous students struggle with engaging with the practices of design. So again, in the context of, of, of black people, again, generally brought involuntarily to the land. And Canada likes to compare itself to the states and pretend like it doesn't have slavery, but it had slavery as well. It actually had slavery in many cases before. You know, like now the New York Times has redone the podcast for 1619 in terms of when the first slaves were brought to the United States. There were slaves that were brought to Canada even before then. And again, what's really interesting is in terms of assimilationist policies, unassimilatable. So I think of the fact that my name is Elizabeth Tunstall, which when people don't know me, think I'm the queen of England, right? Because it's a very English name. English is my first language. Um, in terms of like all of the markers of, let's say, being part of a European cultural heritage, all of those things are there, but the state in and of itself defines itself by making sure that as a black person, I don't belong, right? That I'm never part of the state in and of itself. And, you know, in the context of the United States, you know, like, it was enshrined that we were three-fifths of a human being. So that's how deep it goes. And so, again, design is not innocent of this thing. So one of my um, favorite things to not talk about um, is the invention of the cotton gin. So if you don't know what the cotton gin is, that um, when the production of cotton, what's really the most difficult part is actually removing the seeds, right? So that's what's required to make it useful. Um, it used to take um, an individual, and these individuals were slaves, it would take an individual up to two days to kind of remove from a bunch um, the seeds. Um, so, <laughs> Um, uh, the invention of the cotton gin uh, reduced the time for that to about two hours to achieve the same task. And what was the outcome of this great innovation was that in, let's see, I think in 17, around 1780 or so, that there was about 300,000 slaves that were located throughout most of the South in the United States. By the time that slavery ended in like the 1850s or so, um, the invention of the cotton gin had increased that number to three million because the efficiency that was by design, right? So in the design of this, it knew it was efficient and knew that the labor to produce was, was slave labor. So this allowed the United States to grow and produce cotton to the fact that the three-fourths of the exports of the United States was cotton produced by slaves. So for my black students, many of whom are either North American or Caribbean, Again, design is, is a place where they feel uncomfortable. That design is a site of intergenerational trauma, which um, doesn't often get talked about in our design classes, but they feel it. They feel it in the sense that they feel that there's something about design that they don't quite belong to um, in a comprehensive way. And then for people of color. So people of color is like everyone else who is um, non-white of European heritage is the best way to explain it. 
And again, what becomes interesting is that they, in terms of the relationship to the land, most of the time they've escaped home to become new settlers, right? So they do come to build their good life in the United States or Canada in the same way that, you know, 100, 200, 300, 400, 500 years ago, um, the Europeans came to build a good life um, on indigenous land. And what becomes both painful and um, challenging is that in terms of the assimilationist policies, they have a little bit of privilege to choose, meaning in the sense that they can make decisions to assimilate by losing their language by choice, right? That they make decisions about um, changing their names so they fit more in uh, with the sort of mainstream and so there's a way in which, based on either their place in the chromatocracy, in terms of their skin color, their place in terms of um, the aspects of themselves that they are willing to let go in order to build a better life, that they position themselves quite differently. But it doesn't, it doesn't free them from experiences of racism and oppression, right? So this is an advertising from the uh, 1800s, so 1886, to sell washing powder, but also selling the ideal of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which again, here in San Francisco, this is deep, right? This goes really, really deep. So for even my... Um, students of color who think in many ways that they've come to in the Canada to sort of experience a better life, that design for themselves is also a place where they encounter trauma and encounter the intergenerational loss of their culture and their language, even if it means that they've um, gained access to the privileges and the power um, of the mainstream society. So design has a lot to atone for um, in ways that we don't often talk about. And so while decolonization is about indigenous land sovereignty, because the original crime, let's say, of all of this was the first stealing of indigenous land and the killing of indigenous people in order to have access to that land. Um, for me and us in design, it actually requires liberating design from what we call the modernist project. And the modernist project has two components to it. The first says that progress through technology will bring luxury to the masses. And the second part is that we need to engage in universal mankind, emphasis on the man, I'm using mankind intentionally, which means you have to drop your national and ethnic baggage. Now, in the context of Europe, this was revolutionary, right? In the context of Europe and what we think of modern design, it was so revolutionary that many Europeans were kicked out of Europe for holding these views. I'm like, what do you mean providing like everyday people with the things that the aristocracy have? Get out of here, right? Um, in terms of sort of Nazi um, Germany, many of them who espouse this thing of like universal design, let's get rid of the serifs, right? So that we can all engage in this universal design. They were kicked out of Europe. So this was a utopian and revolutionary idea. But in the context of coming with that ideal to North America, this is the aspect of genocide, right? Leave your ethnic and racial baggage at the door. This becomes an aspect of uh, the crisis around sustainability where that technological efficiency means that, guess what? You're more efficiently um, pillaging the land. So, there are many aspects, there are many traditions of making that go back hundreds and thousands of years. Like, again, I've spent time in Australia, so it goes back 65,000 years documented that I know and others know of. And so design didn't just happen in the 1700s and the 1800s in relationship to this modernist project. And so for us 
at OCAD, it's sort of taking that utopian idea, like if you're saying let's provide it to everyone, actually let's mean everyone. And then that inclusion of everyone, let's remember our relationship to the land in and of itself because that's part of the everyone. And when it comes to, let's say, universal, we may not be universal, but we can create a space in which we accept and respect each other's differences, which is what you are trying to achieve by saying, let's be part of universal mankind. So we can take on those aspects of those projects, but put it in a context of what we call respect, and particularly respectful design. So, OCAD University and respectful design. So when I first arrived at OCAD University, um, I was trying to figure out to take what it means to take the tradition of like des design for humankind, which had been part of the DNA of OCAD for, at that time, 20 years, and to bring it into a dialogue with the things that I had learned and experienced about how to bring indigenous ways of knowing into, um, into a, a design institution. And so within two work weeks of arriving, I put together a workshop where I asked the faculty to define what respectful design means to them. Um, and this is the really nice polished version <laughs> of what they came up with. At OCAD University Faculty Design, we practice what we call respectful design. Respectful design, what does it mean to the faculty of design? It means valuing inclusivity and people's cultures and ways of knowing through empathetic and responsible creative methodologies. It means deepening our relationships to the lives of materials and the craft of making. The challenge facing design today is really to reestablish the relationship with nature. In other words, to design ourselves back into the environment. For example, adding the indigenous concept of seven generations to inform sustainable design. Good design takes a certain amount of humility. We have to recognize that we can do harm as well as good. It's about need over want. Respectful design means acknowledging different values, different manners of production, and different ways of knowing. The widest possible range of diversity with respect to ability, language, culture, and beyond. Designing futures with inclusion and belonging for everyone. Come join us here at OCAD University's Faculty of Design and find out what respectful design means to you. So what are we doing at OCAD University? Um, so one of the advantages that we have in Canada that you don't quite have in the States is we're allowed to do what's called positive discrimination. Basically, that means where we find that there's underrepresentation, uh, we are allowed to uh, give priority to candidates who um, meet that uh, group that we're seeking to embrace and bring into the institution. So for the last mm, eight or so years, OCAD University has actually had a prioritization in hiring for a racialized and indigenous person, so BIPOC people, black, indigenous, and POC people, um, who self-identify in the application process, and we are allowed to do that which then allows us to do some really amazing things. Uh, so two years ago, we had our um, first indigenous cluster hire, uh, which this allowed us to bring in five new indigenous faculty members into OCAD University. Now, OCAD University has had an indigenous visual culture program for 10 years. So we've always had, um, at least again, for the last 10 years, indigenous faculty members. But what this allowed us to do is almost double the number of indigenous faculty members within one year. There are some important aspects of this call that it was open to those who were from Turtle Island. So we, again, approached it from the language and the perspective of indigenous communities who we wanted to embrace. Um, it was open in rank and open in uh, field in the sense that we recognize that if you're a holistic person, you may not fit into 
One would say our colonial categories of this is an industrial designer, this is an artist, this is a theorist. And so we left it open for each of the, um, each of the candidates to define who they are. And it was then our job to figure out how it matches within the things that we need to teach and want to teach or are currently teaching or want to teach in the future. And so we were able to bring in, uh, I went from having zero full-time faculty, indigenous faculty members to three within one year. And what was so, uh, I almost like start crying, getting histamining. What was so amazing, which I'll show you later, is that within six months of arrival, that they had written six new courses for um, the university in terms of bringing indigenous perspectives into design. So that means they arrived ready to make the change happen to the institution. And what's happening now, now it's just been again going on two years, is that they're beginning to move into positions of leadership within the institution. Um, so we're changing the structure of the institution by changing the faculty and changing the ways in which their lived experiences affects the decisions that happen within the institution. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to go through, so I know I like depressed you the first part of this, but there is hope. I bring a message of hope um, that I'm going to walk through some of the work of our faculty members just to give you a sense of what it is that they've taken this idea of decolonization and changed the way in which they approach their teaching and changed the way in which they've approached their research and their practice in and of itself. Or the better way to say it, they haven't necessarily changed. The institution has changed to allow them to bring the fullness of how they want to engage with the world into the institution and into the teaching. So as you said, respectful design means valuing inclusivity, people's, people's cultures and ways of knowing. So introduce you to um, Howard Monroe. So he was the one in the video and the language he was speaking was mischief, which is the language of the Métis people, which is one of the three indigenous groups um, in Canada. So there's First Nations, uh, Métis, and Inuit are the three major groups. And so who is speaking that language? So he's Red River Métis from Winnipeg, Manitoba. And he's our assistant professor of, of industrial design, but he's also, he's the um, co-chair of the Indigenous Education Council, which is the indigenous body of internal as well as ex external um, indigenous experts um, who help guide the decision-making of the institution in terms of its impact on um, indigenous students and faculty within, as well as its impact on indigenous communities outside of the institution. So his work, he again, he's an industrial designer and he builds a lot of his indigenous identity into the work that he does himself. So his expertise is woodwork, but he also is deeply engaged with technology because his perspective is that everyone likes to think of indigenous people of living in the past, existing in the past, and ignoring the fact that there's contemporary engagement with technology and trying to use technology in a way to further the f ability for indigenous communities to flourish. And so in this particular work, that actually the sort of heartbeat, that's the heartbeat of um, the scan of the heartbeat of his son. <laughs> Again, the quills are there to sort of as, as dealing with sort of sewing there's feathers that are there, important symbolically. And all of this is about his project to really, again, introduce indigenous ways of knowing into current industrial design practice, right? That industrial design is not something that happened again in the 1800s, that it goes back mm, at least 12,000 years um, in some communities in Canada. And it's like, and there was innovation, right? The indigenous response to colonization drove so much innovation in the way in which they had to live their lives and to be able to sustain their cultural practices so that they can practice them up today. And that is innovation to be able to do that in response. For me though, 
what's incredible is the work that he's actually doing to our curriculum. So what he's done is he's reframing the design process so that it aligns with the seven grandfather teachings. And I can't, it's not, I don't have permission to tell you much more deeper about the story because that's his story to tell. But what I have permission to tell you about is, again, so what we've taken is seven steps of um, design, sort of a seven step process, and we aligned it with each one of the seven grandfather teachings. So in this case, the analyze and research phase is connected to the seven grandfather teachings around respect. And so the idea is that with respect, it's about how you position yourself in relationship to all those things that exist in the universe. And so if you think about the research process, it's about where do I stand in what I know and what I don't know? And what is it that others know that I can engage with from a relational perspective so that we can share in this knowledge, right? But I have to know where I'm positioned and where I stand in order to be able to do this. And so this is being introduced into our foundation year of industrial design. And what he talks about is that what's important about this is that it makes design not about this external output that you put at the end of one gate in the process of another, but the kind of internal cultivation of the kind of person that you need to be in the world in order to, that your designs, which is the gift that you bring to the world, comes from a place of love, comes from a place of respect, comes from a place of humility, comes from a place of like who you are as a person and your understanding of your relationships to all the things around you. So I get excited, like um, we have a express elevator that goes from the first to the fifth floor. And I always think like my key performance indicator, because I'm a dean, so I have key performance <laughs> indicators, is being in that elevator and having students talk about like, Ooh, how did you feel about the respects phase, right? Were you like, I was a little bit nervous, but you know, I like grounded myself in terms of like, I was learning all these things from around me and I felt really confident in my relationship to those things and I was able to confidently present that back in a way that's not just analytical, but like deeply connected, right? So for me to overhear those kind of conversations, to see that transformation about what design is and what could be, that is what decolonization means through the lens of respectful design. Respectful design also means recognizing that we can do harm as well as good. So I want to introduce you to Sarah Tranum. Um, so she's a European Canadian settler heritage, heritage. She's also an assistant professor of social innovation in our faculty. And the work that she does is working often, she organizes our study abroad programs that we do in the summer. And what I love, like this is how decolonization work. So when I first came, uh, she was doing a project, a study abroad project in India. And um, many of my faculty members of Indian heritage came to me and said, we hate the work that she's doing. Like, can you, can, can you talk to her, right? Of course, I have to talk to her. And um, again, in this context of decolonization, we sat down and we had the hard conversations about what is it that you're doing? What is the relationship? What's the exchange that is happening? Because they were going over to India, doing like a project, let's build a like pathway somewhere that using local materials and let's fly out and then the next year go to another place, right? And so she did the work. She did the reading, she had the hard conversations, she engaged in dialogue. We had, again, a course on like indigenous perspectives. She shined up for the course. She did the work so that she changed the location and partners that we're working with. So now she's working in Costa Rica and the project she's doing is not volunteerism anymore that we have a deep reciprocal relationship with those communities that is ongoing, that is accountable, um, because that's what it means to 
decolonize the kind of work that you're doing when you're bringing students from Canada to go spend time in India or Costa Rica. And so for me, like this has happened only in a time of three years. So for me, for her to go through the fact that, again, all my racialized uh, uh, professors are complaining to them very being very proud of the work that the students are doing and the relationships they're building, that's the potential of decolonization, right? That's potential of change. And it's not just doing it, you know, in overseas. So she builds a relationship with Sketch. Sketch is a community organization that works with um, youth who are um, homeless or at risk of being homeless. And it provides them with uh, uh, design and uh, design skills and marketing skills. So this is a project where, again, they've partnered with Sketch organization to be able to co-design a branding system that will then help the um, Sketch artisans to be able to market and sustainably derive income from the designs that they're doing. And again, it's about accountable relationships. So if we upset them, then we're accountable. We can't run away. We can't get in a flight. Um, we have to sit in our discomfort of what is disrespectful about that relationship and make amends to make it right. And that's the way in which we, again, are entering that space. That's the journey that Sarah's gone through around the relationships he builds with the partnerships that we have. So respectful design meaning designing ourselves back into the environment. Um, so this is James Miller. So he was one of the candidates that we hired from the Indigenous Cluster Hire. So he's of Kanaka Maui, a Native Hawaiian and Japanese American uh, ancestry. He's an assistant professor of environmental design. And he's our expert in dealing with climate change. So his research is with the communities of the Marshall Islands, and basically their island is dropping into the sea because of climate crisis. And so what he's doing is using their indigenous knowledge as a way to help them build resilience as they leave their communities on Marshall Islands and they go to Seattle or they go to, um, they go to Canada or they go to these different communities and what he's helping them do is they have built into their environment social structures and social organizations, which then when you leave that island and you move to, let's say, an apartment complex in Seattle, that's not, that environment is not designed to support the kind of social interactions that the designs that were on the island was afforded. So what he's doing is that he's helping them make explicit their own knowledge about how space is supposed to operate and then help them create designs that will then recreate the conditions in the environment that allow them to sustain and maintain um, their social organization and their social structures in these new contexts, right? And so this is a thing where, again, it's about building community resilience through the local knowledge that they already have. Um, and in many ways, um, helping them make the arguments from a policy perspective um, for why they should be able to maintain these social structures through the environmental structures that are created with them and for them. So my last example would be respectful design, meaning designing futures of inclusion and belonging for everyone and everything. This is Ronnie Lee. She's Canadian of Chinese heritage and assistant professor of industrial design. And she leads this amazing project with the um, Toronto Center for Community Learning and Development. They have a sewing circle which is made up of newly arrived uh, women. Many of them are um, coming from Syria. And they come with a tremendous amount of skills around cooking and sewing but they need a way to make money, right, income from those skills. So what she's done is she's taking the classroom into the community. So once, one day a week, the students go to Regent Park and they learn there. And the women teach them how to sew because, again, 
Sorry, apology, but many of you young people today do not have the strongest skills and soft skills in sewing. So the women teach them how to sew because they have exceptional skills in sewing. And then what the students do is that they bring, in some ways, their design thinking and facilitation skills. So they go and they do research and observations, and they help develop innovative products that are related to the things that are happening in Regent Park. And then the women and the students design things together, and the prototypes then become the things that the women manufacture and sell in their store. And so I'll give you just a sort of some examples of the work that the students did. So this is called the Relocation Project. So I really like this bad by um, Sydney Colleen Sturgis, where it came out of observations of the people playing. So in Regent Park, there's a, a sports center that has swimming, basketball, bunch of other sports. And observing the way in which uh, let's say, what was happening on the basketball court and the way in which the, the young people needed to carry things or those coming out from the swimming practice and the way they needed to carry things. So the bag has this sort of basketball net thing, but that's for where you could put your wet clothing, right? So that it doesn't get onto your dry clothing that you can have or the things that you have inside the bag. And so the color scheme comes from the color scheme of, of the design of the inside of the uh, sports facility. And so it's kind of branded within that. And again, it's just a thing where, um, and it's easy to manufacture. And so like with the bag, the white bag over there, that student Tyler, that was his first sewing project, which this is like the final prototype, so I assure you the first prototype didn't look as good. But through working with the women, who again were exceptional sewers, was able to build up his skills so that he could produce this right by himself. And so again, this is a thing where it's like we're not coming into a community to, uh, to help, so to speak. We're coming, embedding ourselves in a community as part of that community and then learning together, right? And it's happened there because in some ways the women were too intimidated to come to OCAD University on campus. I don't belong there. But our young people belong with them in the community and so it's easier for them to be there. And now the women, guess what? They're not intimidated by coming to OCAD University because it's now part of their community. So for us, respectful design is Again, addressing the way in which culture and ways of belonging go together. So right now, I'm in the middle of a black cluster hire where we're addressing the underrepresentation, I would say the zero representation of black people in the faculty design for 144 years. And for me, what's really important about this is this is from the actual call itself, right? The actual position descriptions. First of all, we're recognizing our 144 years of neglect. I cannot tell you the number of negotiations I had to have to have that included in the language. And what it is that's really, really important is that we used, we didn't talk about be in this industrial design program or be in this program. We said, are you interested in black explicative futures? because that's what we want to bring into our community. Are you interested in the relationship between hip hop aesthetics and the business and social justice of design? Because that's what we're calling for into our institution. And so we recognize what was resonant with the community. And all I have to say is that the community has responded beautifully. Like our pool is so deep that the institution cannot believe that these people existed. Right? And I was like, I know they exist. <laughs> but you have to call to them. And so what we're learning is if you be authentic, if you be truthful, if you own the fact that, yeah, you know, for 144 years, you might have screwed things up, right? If you're honest about that, that, that creates the conditions in which, again, for me and my students, you could be a professional designer 
and be all the beauty and diversity of who you are, and that will be celebrated. Like we've been doing, like again, some of the interviews and, and what the response has been from the candidates is that this is the first time I've seen who I am celebrated by an institution. So that's what respectful design means to us. And so I ask you to find out what it means to all of you. And that's what the decolonial school is really about, is trying to find out for you, what does this mean? How is it possible? And then have hope. Because I started out, you know, I could tell the energy. You were so depressed. You're like, I'm about ready to leave design. I'm going to find some other field. But there is hope, right, that you can make the change. And it doesn't take a lot of time to make the change. It just takes that commitment and that passion and that understanding and that humility. The most important thing is that humility to understand that there's so much that you need to learn. And the only way you can learn it is being open to other people who have that knowledge. Um, and then bring about the change. Like everyone's like, oh, the work you're doing is so aspirational. I hate that word, right? Because you just do it. No one, we didn't get any extra money to do these hires. We just had lines that, you know, basically do the retirements and people leaving. And you know what we said? We're going to commit ourselves to this, to make this happen. So it didn't take extra money. It didn't take anything except the thoughtfulness that this is important. So let's just do it now. Let's be the change now. I was not going to wait for 145 years for there to be a black faculty member, right? And I don't even count. I'm above the faculty, so I don't even get to count within all that. So just be the change. Bring about the change, because you, you can do it. It's possible. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, Enough time for questions? Yeah? Good. All right. Do we have time? So, any questions? So, my name's Janice. I did my uh, Bachelor's of Design at York. And I was really curious as you're doing all the work with the different special hiring projects that you're doing, um, can you talk a little bit about how that's sparking conversation with colleagues at Sheridan or at York? and? With the surplus of applicants, are you seeing any similar movement at the other institutions? Yeah, so actually York just announced they're going to do a black cluster hire. And I spoke to them, so they actually took the template that we developed um, awesome. and are figuring out how to do it within their institution. And it's really, and again, it's really fascinating in the sense that, um, um, you know, it's like, York has had, let's say, they they actually started a program in Black Studies, and which is actually doing quite fascinating work, um, and it's a thing that they just couldn't figure out, like the language to use until they saw it, and then as soon as they saw it, they're like, okay, now we know how to do it. So they're doing it. They're doing it. And then our indigenous cluster hire many different institutions try to replicate that, not with the same level of success. But a lot of it has to do with like the conditions, right? So um, again, we already had indigenous faculty at OCAD. So when bringing more in, you still wouldn't feel like you're a token. Um, that we had, um, again, because we were the first ones to do it, that we were the ones to demonstrate the dedication and the risk taking in such a way. So a lot of people gave us the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> Um, so, and that's it. I've like I, I. The black cluster hire call was the first job position I ever heard of that went viral. It actually went viral. Like it was showing up in places that I didn't even like. How did it get there? Because I have no idea how it got there or how it was sent. And so there's a way in which what I do right is I I hope to try to create the conditions of possibility. And so just by, in some ways, the institution trusting me and me trusting the institution, we, are, we take the risk, right, to show what's possible and cross our fingers and toes and hope that it all works for the best with the understanding that um, it's not just our intentions are good, um, but that we're, we're 
very much dedicated to making this change happen. Um, and so, so others are definitely seeing it and trying to figure out how they can do it and which aspects of what we've done is applicable to what they can do. But definitely, like in the Canadian context, Everyone's going to have a black cluster hire next year. And again, what's great is that the pool was so deep. The pool was so deep. Like, I'm not even threatened by it, right? I'm like, if I'm going to ask permission to send the names of the people that we spoke to who we couldn't accept, because again, we have only three positions that we're going to do. And I tell you, our pool is much, much deeper than that, right? So, yeah, like, I'm, you know, I say Canada with these you know, end point of the Underground Railroad. Um, and so in a time where um, sometimes things feel really bleak, we hope to be like, again, that, that possibility of hope. Um, and other institutions are watching and listening um, and hopefully uh, following. And like I said, I will send you anything that you need or want. I can explain to you how we did it step by step. Um, because we want to change, um, we want to change the relationship between people and design, right? We want it to be a source of um, joy and not trauma. And like I said, the first half, there's a lot of trauma, and we have to like recognize that and accept that, but change it as well. Thank you so much for your talk and for being here. Um, my name is Pam Daniels, and I teach design at Northwestern University. We have a tiny little campus out here in San Francisco. Um, and I'm curious what attracted you personally to the field of design in the face of so few people like you. <laughs> I was a designer before I heard the term design. Um, so again, I've always, like when I was a kid, I was always in art classes. Um, and then when I, um, <laughs> and so when I was doing my work for my PhD, like, you know, you're supposed to do like a weekly response. And sometimes my professors would get a drawing. Sometimes they would get a comics, you know, graphic strip. Uh, sometimes they get a word essay, not all this. If they did, I would do drawings on the margins of it. And I, they would give me bonus points. So they were really encouraging in that way. <laughs> So there's a way in which I was always interested in the relationship between like form, content, and context. So each chapter of my PhD actually had a different structure um, based on the, I did my research in Ethiopia, so based on the vernacular mode of expression, I, each chapter was different, which totally freaked out my committee, but whatever. <laughs> um, so when I went to do my first job at Sapient, and I started hanging out with designers, I was like, oh, I found my people, because I didn't quite feel like I belonged in anthropology. Um, and then I started going to design conferences and felt I didn't belong there either. Um, and then I started community, creating a community around design anthropologists, so building programs and things so that people who were kind of hybrid could find a place. I always like my programs were like the land of misfit toys. <laughs> Um, and, um, and so, and that's continued, right? That's continued. So I go to design conferences and I complain about the lack of depth. And then I go to anthropology conferences and I complain about how their poor communications through their visuals. Um, and then I go to community conferences around people who are really bringing the depth and bringing that, uh, understands the importance of clear communication and um, feel at home, and some of them I've, you know, I've trained or mentored myself. So that's kind of, um, and I love design. Like I love, you. Uh, it's so hard to explain to people how powerful it is to be able to take some abstract ideal and give it a tangible form that allows people to engage and interact and negotiate and argue and find joy through that form. Um, and, so, um, and so I love the beauty and the power that comes from that, that moment of transformation that designers bring and, um, and just happy to be part of that community, right? To be able to contribute to that community. 
Good evening, Dory. Uh, my name is Ricardo Gomez. I'm a professor over at the School of Design at San Francisco State. Um, so I had a question just in regards to what you started out with, with the whole kind of alienation or intimidation that uh, would seem to um, alienate the gravity of more people of color, be mm -hmm. it uh, mm -hmm. uh, indigenous culture, people of color, black people, to design. Um, and again, I've been in design many early on, mm -hmm. being one of the first, like you were the first mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. your area. I was the first of an undergraduate to graduate from industrial design at, in Boston at Mass Art, Mass College of Art. And yet it hasn't changed radically, mm. um, you know, over the years. And I'm talking 40 years, 40 years. Um, and we only can live for so long. <laughs> and how do we witness this change? Mm. So going back to how does your program and you creating this paradigm mm -hmm. that hopefully will influence other programs, when does it begin to influence the industry, the, the profession? Because it's the whole notion yeah. of build it and yeah. they will come. Well, they say, well, we don't have anybody. We, we can't find them. Um, but they don't encourage them. Yeah. So how do you begin to impact the real beast uh, in, of where design really flourishes? So the advantage is that I'm in Toronto. And so it's very easy to have those conversations because, again, if you're in Canada and you're in Toronto and you want to survive as an industry, you have to, be, you have to bring the diversity and inclusion. Because, again, Toronto is the most diverse city in the world. So if you're not speaking the language, if you're not connecting to the experiences, you're not going to survive. And Canada is a small market. You can get away with that in the States, right? Because it's like, oh, I have so many people that I can do. You can't do that in Canada. Right, You can't survive in Canada without doing that. So in that sense, my job in the Canadian context is easy because it's just making awareness. So it's like a couple of weeks ago, I had a meeting with the um, general manager of Instagram Facebook Canada. And, <laughs> and it was really interesting because, you know, like um, we met. He didn't read any of the materials that I had sent ahead of time and whatever, whatever. And then I was explaining what it is we're doing. He's like, this is the best conversation I've had all month. And it was the end of January, so it wasn't, you know, so it was real, right? <laughs> and, um, and then he's like, I need to come to OCAD. I didn't even know what you were doing. I just thought this was a little art school. And what you're doing is amazing and tremendous. And I don't know why it's not over all over the city. And I was like, because you're not promoting it all over the city, so help me, right? <laughs> I keep it real. Um, so in that sense, the conversation is easier. But again, like I've been to, i deeply involved with the Design Management Institute. They've had two years of their um, diversity and inclusion conference. And again, you're sitting there with like the head of global design for 3M, and they're talking about diversity. They're showing you the work that they're doing around diversity and inclusion. And not just from the global perspective, but figuring out, OK, I might be a global company, but what does diversity and inclusion look like in India? What does diversity and inclusion look like in the States? What does diversity and inclusion look like in Mexico? And so there are the big players in many ways are thinking about this. Like again, Google's built to 200 people, uh, um, uh, diversity and inclusion team, again, just in the last couple of years. Um, so in that sense, industry is shifting because they're realizing they can't survive. You know, pop demographics in and of itself says you can't survive, right? Um, the thing in terms of like the pipeline issue um, is like I said, the pull for our call was really deep. And you know why it was deep? Because we spoke to them in a way that they actually heard, right? And so to me, it's a thing that like the people are there um, you just have to connect with them, and you also have to like um, change your idea of what it is that you need, right? Um, you need people who are smart, creative, um, kind, kindness is very important, um, and who are willing to learn and grow. And then that's it. The rest can be taught or trained or whatever if they're smart they can pick it up. And so the ideal, and we run into this all the time, even with the search, like, we have to have the perfect candidate, right? And I'm like, 
long conversations around, but you do know that that perfect candidate you described would have to go through this, this, and this, and this, and this, and this in order to be that, right? And that's not what you want, actually. So in that sense, the work is also breaking down the expectations of what it is that you want and what it is that you need. And for me, it's about what you need are people who are aware of how their lived experiences impact their work and their connection to communities, right? That's what you're looking for. And like I said, everything else you can learn or train, right? That's the stuff you can't teach. And if they don't have that, then, then you have some of the scenarios we're talking about today where you have technology that's racist and creates further structures of oppression, right? Um, so I'm lucky in Canada that those conversations are easier to have, but I also travel all over the place, right, to talk about what we're doing to industry to change their ideals of what's possible, right? And they're listening because they know their survival depends on them changing, right? Um, and like I said, I build the networks of people to be able to support that. At OCAD, I have a Black Youth Design Initiative. So we're starting with the 8 to 12 year olds. Um, 8 to 12 year olds, me, uh, a couple of our students, uh, maybe a professional designer. We come out, we spend three hours. Imagine Make and Connect. Imagine your problems, imagine your solutions. Pick one, we're going to make something, you're going to make something tangible, respond to it, and then we're going to connect what you've made and the problem to wider society, namely colonization and racism. And you have something to take home. We'll introduce you to a bunch of designers that you didn't know, both local and international, so that when, because it starts at 8 to 12, someone's starting to discourage you from drawing, because what are you going to do with that drawing thing that you do? It's like, well... I'm going to become Director X, right? And I'm going to be making movies because, you know, he started out making flyers for, like, parties. That's where he started. So I'm going to become that. And I can get paid so you don't have to worry, especially immigrant parent, mom or dad. I'm not going to worry. I'm going to make a living doing this and doing what it is that I love and enjoy. And so we're starting at 8 to 12 saying, okay, let's shut that you can't draw anymore down because we're gonna show you the possibilities of what you can do with that drawing. And then we're changing the portfolio criteria so that many of the, many of the young people are not able to get in to post-secondary or even get jobs because their portfolio doesn't look like Bauhaus, basically. So we're going through a process of saying, what is, what is, what is examples of aesthetic excellence in Caribbean culture, in African culture, in North American black culture and develop guides around that. So if some young person is coming from a Jamaican family and they're laying down their portfolio that's based on all them attending the Jamaican Community Association events where there's no white space in anything. When you look at that, you can say comparatively, uh, this is excellent in relationship to that and then they can get the job, right? They can, get the, they can get into OCAD University. So we have a program where like, there's five pillars where we're breaking down. And this came from the students. They were like, I wish I had this. I wish I had this. I wish I had this. And we're building it out so that there is no reason for them not to be dissuaded to go into design, right? Um, and through their participation in that, they're connecting back to the community and what it is that they love about design and how to make design meaningful for those communities. And that, like I said, that's just a prototype. We're prototyping it. And once we sort of get it all running, like again, we go and franchise that. <laughs> because it's the thing, how do you connect with people where they are and how do you remove the barriers that exist in their minds but also in society that keeps them from seeing the possibilities of what they can do for design. And so that's the work we're doing addressing the pipeline, um, as well as changing industry. So that, like again, no one has to choose between who they are and what it means to be a professional designer. Oh, okay. Thank you, everyone. And before you leave, 
Um, I'd like to thank Dr. Uh, Tunstall for being here this yes. evening. Thank you. Before we all escape, I also want to thank everyone that helped to bring you here this evening. And there's quite a list, so just bear with me for just a moment. Thank you to the design division, the fine arts division, the furniture program, the graphic design program, diversity studies program, critical studies program, the President's Diversity Steering Group, Curriculum Committee, the Decolonial School, and of course, Shalini Agrawal, Catherine Lamb, Juan Carlos Rodriguez Rivera, and thank you very much, and we will see you tomorrow. Thank you.